Do you need to find a skeleton? How would you tell people that design? You personally, how would you tell that design? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on this. Imagine this. You're a researcher in Brazil. You just heard that the government is thinking about approving plans for an agriculture business to use a swath of land in the Amazon for growing fruit. But pictures from helicopters in the area indicate that there is a group of humans who have had no formal contact with the government of Brazil or any recorded contact with modern international society. They are what in anthropology is called uncontacted. No one knows what language they speak. But if the current plans go ahead, they will be displaced from their traditional lands, possibly at gunpoint, and there is no one who can advocate for them or their land rights. So, you get funding and provision for an expedition to their territory, bringing gifts with you to ingratiate yourself. We'll assume this goes well, and while the tribe's people don't know any languages you know, such as Portuguese, Spanish, English, or German, you can get some basic meaning across with gestures, and you start studying their language. Unsurprisingly, they have no writing system and aren't even familiar with the concept. But you are taking notes, and you need to write down what words you are hearing and your hypotheses about the grammar and vocabulary they are using. Many of the sounds are familiar, and you can use letters like B, D, P, or K, but they also have exotic sounds like K or K. How do you write these? Well, you could come up with your own system to write them, and then note down a careful description of what the sound is, and how you're writing it. But what if your notes are damaged and you are injured or killed, or people are just lazy and don't want to have to learn your idiosyncratic method of transcribing this language? Well, fortunately for you, there has been a solution to this problem for well over a hundred years. It's the International Phonetic Alphabet. The IPA, as it's called, has a symbol for every sound that has been encountered in a human language, an extended version for sounds typical of speech pathologies, but not non-pathological language use, and a space for all the sounds that humans can make with their vocal apparatus, but haven't been observed using in languages. This alphabet is in universal use among linguists, and is increasingly being used for dictionaries to standardize pronunciation guides and move away from pronunciation systems that require the user to learn a new system each time he or she buys a dictionary from a different company. Why might you want to learn about the IPA, dear viewer? Well, if you are interested in linguistics in general, or if you're interested in learning a particular language, or if you're a dialect coach, or you're interested in dialects, or you're a singer who would like to learn to sing in another language but don't really want to learn to speak the language, or you're a singing coach who wants to teach other people to sing in languages, or you'd just like to be able to write down the sounds that other people are saying or that you're saying unambiguously. The IPA can greatly simplify trying to understand how to pronounce words in foreign languages or other dialects of your own language. For example, how do you pronounce the Arabic word Tabib. It means doctor, and the first sound in it Ta. is like a T, but it's not quite the same, and you can tell because Arabic uses a different letter for that sound, and mixing them up can mean saying the wrong word. Online descriptions say it's emphatic, but what the heck does that mean? You can try listening to it a lot, and that might help, but if you're not very practiced at listening carefully to human speech sounds, this might not help either. But, a quick Google search for the letter and the IPA transcription will immediately yield the correct pronunciation with the use of one letter with a diacritic. It's that easy. You could search for days and not find the answer without the IPA. But, armed with the IPA and some knowledge of phonetics, it'll take you less than a minute to know how to pronounce that strange sound. Before we get into the IPA, there are a couple things to go over, and a caveat. We'll take the caveat first. The scope of this topic is pretty big. And for that reason, I'm only going to go over the pulmonic consonants in depth. This is because vowels are far more complex than consonants, and nearly every language in the world uses only pulmonic consonants. So much so that when a language family uses other consonants, it's usually the one thing people most often point out about it. There will be another video going over things that this video didn't go over, so stay tuned. Another thing to mention is that the way the IPA was constructed has a bias toward certain languages, making it a bit cumbersome for some others. Most notably is that it encodes a difference that many European and Middle Eastern languages make between consonants with separate letters. But if other languages that make other distinctions are transcribed, such as Korean, it becomes a bit more complicated. Basically, the IPA treats voicing as sufficiently distinct between sounds that it indicates voicing with separate characters, while aspiration is indicated with a diacritic. 
You may not know what all that means, but suffice it to say, most European and Semitic languages use voicing to distinguish between sounds, but many languages do not, and the IPA was designed with the former in mind. The last thing to go over before we actually dive into the IPA pulmonic consonant chart is the vocabulary you'll need to even understand the thing. Okay, it's anatomy time. So as you may or may not be surprised to know, humans typically use their mouths and throats to pronounce all the languages of the world. The only exception is sign languages, and these only occur in populations with the inability, either because of deafness or muteness, to use their vocal apparatus. No natural language has been found which requires things like hand clapping, finger snapping, stomping, or the like as a part of speech. So the important parts of your vocal apparatus are, from the anterior portion of your mouth going back, the lips, the teeth, the alveolar ridge, the hard palate, the tongue, the vellum, the uvula, the pharynx, and the larynx. Also important is the nasal cavity. The lips, teeth, and tongue probably need no introduction, but the others might. The alveolar ridge is the bit of tissue just behind your front teeth. You touch your tongue to it when you say sounds like t. The palate, or hard palate, is just behind this, and you press the middle of your tongue against it when you make sounds like k. The vellum is also called the soft palate, and is what the back of your tongue rises towards when you make the sound y as in yes. The uvula is the dangly bit in the back of your throat that you can see if you open wide and look in a mirror. The pharynx is the part of your throat that you tighten when breathing on your glasses to fog them a bit before you clean them. The larynx is your voice box. Okay, so let's finally look at the pulmonic consonant chart. This is the pulmonic consonant chart, and the first thing you'll notice is that it is arranged into columns and rows, and you'll probably also notice that there are a lot of letters familiar to you, especially if you know, say, the Greek alphabet. Most letters in the IPA are Greek or Latin, or are a variation on a Greek or Latin letter with a similar sound. So let's go over the columns. The columns are arranged by where in the mouth the sound is made, going from the front to the back. First is bilabial. These sounds are made by bringing both lips together, so sounds like p, b. Next is labiodental. These sounds are made by bringing the lower lip against the top teeth, such as in f and v. Next are dental, alveolar, and palatalveolar. This column is a bit complicated, but just know that except for the fricative sounds f, s, and sh, all the sounds in this big column are really made by putting the tongue against the alveolar ridge. Those sounds are made by putting the tongue against the top teeth for th, against the alveolar ridge for s, and just behind the alveolar ridge for sh. Next is retroflex. And this is a kind of sound English doesn't use much, but is common in some other languages, such as Hindi, and is part of what gives many Indian speakers their distinctive consonant sounds. For example, in the word tomato, the T sound T. is actually retroflex. Palatal is only used in English for the Y sound in words like yes, but consonants in this place of articulation are common in some other languages, especially Slavic languages like Russian. Velar is used in English and nearly all other languages. It is where you make sounds like k and g, but also ng, and even the ch sound in Scottish words like loch, as in loch ness. Uvular involves moving the back of your tongue to the dangly bit called the uvula. Such sounds are not common in most European languages, but they do occur in the French r sound, such as in the word rendre. Pharyngeal consonants are quite rare, and outside of Semitic languages, they are almost unheard of. However, in Semitic languages, they are quite common. For example, the Arabic word for I, like the one that you see with, is Ein. And it starts with a voiced pharyngeal fricative. Ay. Last but not quite least, we come to the glottal sounds. While there are not many of these, they are surprisingly common, even in English. For example, the letter H, when pronounced, is a glottal fricative. And the glottal stop is actually common as a replacement for the letter T between vowels as in how someone with a Cockney accent might pronounce the word bottle as ball. So now that we know all the points of articulation in the standard pulmonic consonant chart, let's go over mode of articulation. If you know the place and mode of articulation of any consonant, in theory at least, you should be able to pronounce it. Before we get started, one thing you should be aware of is why some grid spaces have more than one letter in them. In such cases, the letter on the left is unvoiced and the letter on the right is voiced. In voice letters, the larynx vibrates when the sound is pronounced, and in unvoiced sounds, it is not. This is easy to distinguish with your own vocal cords. Place your palm against your throat so that you can feel your Adam's apple on your palm. 
Now say an F sound, f, but as you were saying it, turn it to a V sound, v, and then back again, like this. You'll notice that when you say the V sound, you can feel an extra vibration in your palm. That's because you're passing air over the structures of your larynx to make them vibrate. This is what it means to voice a sound in phonetics. The first mode of articulation from the top is plosive. These are also called stops. In these sounds, the airflow from your lungs is entirely obstructed by whatever part of your vocal anatomy is making the sound. For example, in a bilabial plosive, like b, your lips come together and stop the air entirely, and then they are released, making the sound in question. Next is nasal. These are also plosives, but they are made by passing air through the nose as well as the mouth. Standard English has three nasal sounds, m, n, and n, but many languages have others. No known language entirely lacks nasal sounds, which is interesting, since there's no particular reason a language would have to include them, and hypothetically, a language without them could function just fine. Trills are next, and while they are common in many European languages, such as Spanish, they are not present in standard English. The Spanish word for dog, perro, has a trill for the double R. Trills occur when the tongue is lax and allowed to vibrate back and forth while the air passes over it. Many English speakers have a lot of trouble making these sounds, and they can take practice if you're not used to them. Taps or flaps are more or less the same as trills, except that the tongue only vibrates once. In contrast to the Spanish word perro, the word for dog, the word for butt is perro, which has a flap. It also occurs in some dialects of English, such as the Scottish pronunciation of the word girl, as in girl. But in many dialects, it can replace t as well. Next up are fricatives, and these are sort of like the superstars of consonants. There is a fricative in every point of articulation that has been used in some language, and most languages have quite a few fricatives. Depending on dialect, English can have as many as 10 of these sounds, or as few as 6. Sounds like th, sa, za, sha, and ja are all fricatives. Now there's a common mode of articulation which you won't see on this list, and we'll go over it when we go over diacritical marks. It's a fricative. Sounds like the English ch sound in church, or the Japanese sound in words like tsunami. The reason these aren't given their own letter is that they are actually a combination of a plosive and a fricative one after the other, and are written as such. Now we come to the special boys of consonants, the lateral fricatives. These sounds are rare outside of Mesoamerican native languages, and chances are that you have never heard one unless you seek out such languages. They are pronounced similar to fricatives, but the tongue touches the point of articulation at the alveolar ridge, and the air is allowed to pass to either side. The one place you might have heard them in English is with speakers with what is called a slushy lisp, in which the alveolar fricatives are realized as lateral fricatives, such as in the word sauce, which is pronounced sauce. Approximants are almost vowels, and the only common one is the J letter, which despite looking like the letter at the start of the word juice, is pronounced like the sound at the beginning of yield. This is the only common approximant, but there are others. Just like lateral fricatives are uncommon, so are lateral approximants, and they are basically analogous to approximants the same way lateral fricatives are to fricatives. They are made at the same point of articulation as the associated approximant, but the air is directed around the sides of the tongue. Well, that's it, all the sections on the chart. Now, for fun, we'll go through the constant inventory of two languages English, as all my viewers are familiar with it, and Klingon because, well, it's my channel, and I'll do what I want. American Standard English uses one consonant that isn't on the plumonic chart, which is w, which is a glide sound. Let's not worry about this too much, but it also has two affricatives, ch and j, or the hard j sound. These are written on screen with the tie bar as standard. Again, we'll go over that in another video. For now, just accept it. I'm going to give these an order of unvoiced, then voiced, where a voiced and unvoiced pair occur. We have the bilabial stops, pa and ba, the alveolar stops, ta and da, the velar stops, ka and ga, the labial dental fricatives, fa and va, the dental fricatives, tha and tha, the alveolar fricatives, sa and za, the palatal fricatives, sha and ja, and the glottal fricative, Ha. We have the palatal a fricatives, cha and ja, the bilabial nasal, ma, the alveolar nasal, 
na, the velar nasal, na, the lateral fricative, la, the retroflex approximate, ra, the palatal approximate, ya, and the semivowel, wa. Next up is Klingon. Klingon actually uses four affricatives and the same glide as in English. As before, the affricatives are written as per standard with a tie bar, but again, don't worry about this right now. The Klingon consonants, given in the order they appear in the Klingon alphabet, are a voiced bilabial stop, b, an unvoiced alveolar affricative, cha, a voiced retroflex stop, da, a voiced and unvoiced palatal fricative, ra and ha, a voiced alveolar affricative, ja, the lateral approximate, la, a bilabial nasal, ma, an alveolar nasal, na, a velar nasal, na, an unvoiced bilabial stop, pa, an unvoiced uvular stop, ha, an unvoiced uvular fricative, ha, a voiced alveolar trill, ra, an unvoiced retroflex fricative, sha, an unvoiced alveolar stop, ta, a unvoiced alveolar affricative with lateral release, ta, a bilabial voiced fricative, va, the glide, wa, the approximate, ya, and the glottal stop, a. And to put that in the middle word, it might sound like Ah, uh, ah. Uh. So there you go. That's a very, very unusual consonant inventory that you would not expect to see in most human languages. But that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed this. There's going to be at least one more episode in this series talking about the International Phonetic Alphabet. And if people like this linguistics content, there might be more of that in the future. But that's going to depend on the reaction from my audience. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please go ahead and do so. And make sure you hit the bell icon so you're always notified when there's more Dapper Dino content. Please make sure you like this video, share it with your friends, leave a comment telling me what you thought and whether you want to see more of this kind of content or not, and I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. I want to take a little time to thank my channel members and patrons, especially those pledging $20 or more. Bob Knob, Bent Hovind, Ian Chen, Chris Love, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bead, Patrick Dennis, and Res Instance. YouTube is a very volatile platform, what with fraudulent copyright claims, demonetization, and the ever-decreasing share of ad revenue on the platform. It is very hard to rely on YouTube. My members and patrons help keep this channel going, and without them, the channel wouldn't exist. If you'd like to join my Patreon, the link is in the description, and if you'd like to become a channel member, that link is below the video. It's the join button here on YouTube. Either way, you'll get access to early videos, an exclusive Discord server, and if you pledge enough, 3D assets you can use in your own projects.